Good morning. Come on in, everyone. Welcome to Heritage Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Dan. It's my privilege to welcome you this morning. We're so delighted that you're here with us to worship our God together. Uh, if you would take your bulletins and turn to the second to last page, I want to highlight a couple of announcements. Uh, the first big announcement is because we will have a baptism this morning, uh, we'll have cake afterwards. So be sure to grab a piece of cake. Man, I thought there'd be a little more enthusiasm for cake. That's, that's all right. Whew, there we go. Yeah, that's allowed. Uh, okay, so Sunday school will be at 11.30 a.m. Adult and children's classes are ongoing today. And we have uh, HMS Kids Club at 2.30 p.m. So take a look in the back at, this, at the sheet for that. And also, um, Captain Lambert can give you any information you need. Look for the, the man in the captain's hat after the service. Uh, Tuesday morning theology at 6 a.m. at Chick-fil-A in Warrington. I actually finally made it this week. I was being mercilessly texted, unrelentlessly mocked for not showing up at 6 a.m. Um, and Piper woke me up really early that day. It was really wonderful just seeing 10 guys get together and talk about Christ Set Forth by Thomas Goodwin. I love that everybody highlighted Samson ripping off the gates of the city and carrying them to the top of the hill, and that's how Jesus has opened the doors to heaven for us. I mean, every guy is going to underline that in a book. So if you're interested in having a great time and some mediocre coffee but wonderful breakfast sandwiches, um, <laughs> check that out. I think you'll be encouraged. Youth group this week is Wednesday night at 6.30 here at Heritage. And then Friday night, uh, there's a women's paint night at the Old Rog Barn. The address is there, and there's more information on Realm for that. I know I just went through a lot of announcements, but here's a couple more. Uh, the 29th, Reformation Sunday, we have the Kawachis visiting. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity to meet them, but many of you know them. And Pastor Kawachi will be preaching in the morning service. So be sure to be praying for them and their time here with us. Hopefully we can be an encouragement to them. Also October 29th, we're going to have a Newcomer's Luncheon. So the Newcomer's Luncheon is something we want to start doing regularly. This is for you if you have been visiting and would like to know more about Heritage, or if you have recently become a member and have not taken an HPC 101 course, we'd like to kind of dovetail these two things this time around. Uh, so I know that's a, a limited number of people, but we'll put an RSVP up for that and come and talk to me or one of the elders for more information. I think that's everything that I should highlight right now. Let's take a moment now, quiet our hearts as we come to the Lord in worship. Well, this morning, our God calls us to worship him from Daniel 2. I know that before every service we say, let's take a moment and quiet our hearts as we come to worship. But it, it can be difficult, can it, to quiet our hearts in the middle of uh, so much turmoil, um, global strife, wars and rumors of wars as uh, we've witnessed in the news. But this call to worship reminds us of the one who is sovereign over all things. So if you are able, please stand as God calls us to worship from Daniel 2. 20 to 23, and please read the words in your bulletin that are in bold. This is God's word. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. This reveals deep and hidden things. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of our fathers, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Please remain standing. We will sing hymn number 100 in your hymnal. Holy, holy, holy. Hymn number 100.
Our good and gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks this morning for calling us by your word to worship you. We're not worthy to draw near to you of ourselves, but by the gift of grace we've received in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we come this morning. You are high and above all things, and you have seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. Though we not, might not feel this to be true in the day to day, it is true. And we are in awe that you, our God, would come to us to bring us to you. Father, we give you praise for your gracious welcome. Give us an awareness this morning of your power that governs all things for the good of your people and for your glory. Lord Jesus, we give you praise for your grace. We are overjoyed today, not only to partake of your grace in the sacrament of the supper, but to see the sign of your cross work in our place applied to a little baby, receiving her as a member of your covenant, giving witness to your goodness to even those who can't call on you as we ought. Holy Spirit, we give you praise for how you are at work in us and among us, changing us to be more like Jesus, showing us the gospel in word and sacrament, opening the eyes of our hearts to see wonderful things in the word you inspired. Be with us and at work among us this morning. We pray now together using those words with which our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn now to confess our sins, I want to ask you to think about Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the psalm that we'll be using in just a moment as our corporate confession of sin. Uh, the superscription of Psalm 51, the heading that you see in your Bible, it's not inspired scripture, but it gives us good background on why this psalm was written. The superscription to Psalm 51 reads like this, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. The fact that we're reading a psalm of David a prayer and praise to God after one of the darkest moments of sin in his life assures us that there is more grace in Christ than sin in us. We can confess our sins and know that the Lord hears us and he forgives us and he loves us. We will yet praise him again. So take a moment now and silently confess your sins and then we will confess our sins together using the words of Psalm 51. Let's pray. Please join together in prayer from Psalm 51, 1 to 4 in your bulletin. Praying together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity 
and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Amen. Hear now this word of assurance from Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Are you standing in that grace today? Not in your own works, not in what you might be able to do to make God love you, but the grace which he has lovingly given you by faith in Jesus. If that's your hope this morning, Christian, then there's good news for you today. By your faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you can worship God in peace. Please stand if you're able. We will sing our song of assurance, which is in your bulletin, Before the Throne of God Above. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, we have the privilege now in just a moment uh, to welcome some of our young covenant children forward to be received and admitted to the sacrament of the table. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, and Peter preached the first Christian sermon. He expounded the scriptures and he called those gathered there in Jerusalem to repent and believe the good news about Jesus. 
Uh, the response was incredible. Many responded to Peter's preaching, saying in Acts 2.37, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That very day, 3,000 new believers in Jesus were admitted uh, to the church. And we're not admitting 3,000 souls here this morning, uh, but we are welcoming uh, new members, Sam and Hannah, after the sermon, together with baptizing their daughter, Juliet. And we're also receiving uh, this morning Kezia and Kaylin Rapier, uh, admitting them to the sacrament of the table. Uh, If you would go ahead and come on up, Kezia and Kaylin, and elders, please come up as well. You can all kind of gather over here. Uh, This morning, uh, ruling elder Daniel Brewer and I interviewed uh, Kezia and Kalen, and they came with a written testimony prepared, and it was just wonderful to hear about the Lord's work in their lives. Here, girls, come on up. And it is just wonderful to be able to welcome them to uh, full communion. Uh, That's what it means to be a communicant membership, to be admitted to this sacrament, because they now understand uh, what it means. They, they're able to discern the body of Christ and the blood of Christ broken and shed for them. So they have given a uh, testimony of their faith. I'm just going to ask you now those membership questions that we talked about earlier, and you could respond with, I do. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope except in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor or seek to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and its peace? All right, thank you. Let's give them a warm welcome. Good morning. Uh, My name is... Chris Solderog, and I'm one of the elders here at Heritage Presbyterian Church. Uh, we just sang a very powerful song, um, and I'd like to reflect upon the lyrics of that uh, for a moment before we pray. The song says, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. When we become Christians, we do not experience an immediate deliverance from all of our troubles, our trials, and our sin. The devil points to our problems and our weaknesses, and he uses them to accuse us. He points to our fallen world, making us doubt that God is on his throne. And he points to our sin and accuses us of being unworthy of salvation. Satan wants us to turn our minds inward upon our troubles and our circumstances and to feel that all is hopeless. Many people in the world right now are in despair searching for something or someone to deliver them. It's easy for us to despair also, but we must not fall into the devil's trap because the accuser uses the law to separate us from God. We must look upward to the great, unchangeable I Am, the King of glory and grace, who died for our sins and already paid the price to redeem us. Let us lift our hearts to him in prayer now. Lord, we look around our world at wars, at conflict, at discord, and we cry out to you, Lord, deliver us. We lift up the war raging in Israel right now, Lord, and we ask that you protect the innocent and give strength to those who can bring a just end to this conflict. There are reports of barbarism, atrocities, and heinous acts inflicted by terrorists in Hamas and Hezbollah. May your justice visit those who commit atrocities and prevail upon the land. Lord, create a lasting and durable peace from the ashes of this conflict 
and let those in the region know that there is peace at the foot of your cross. We pray for our leaders that they would have wisdom to respond properly to this war, to contain the conflict, and to evacuate any American civilians that may still be in danger. We specifically thank you, Lord, for the protection of the Fresta Valley Robotics team who was competing in Israel when Hamas attacked and returned safely home earlier this week. Thank you for that mercy, Lord. And even as war rages in the Middle East and Ukraine, we have conflict on our own government. Lord, restore order to the House of Representatives and give, government, give our government a desire to govern in such a way as to promote the good of the people. In our state, voting is underway for local, statewide, and congressional offices. Lord, we ask that you would raise up leaders that will be obedient to your will to defend what is good and to punish that which is wicked. Lord, we pray for your continued grace upon your church. You know, Lord, that your church is not perfect. Every member of your church is a sinner. We sin against you, we sin against ourselves, and we sin against our neighbor. Lord, as you have reconciled us to you through the blood of Jesus, give us grace to reconcile to one another as well. Give each of us strength to forgive one another for the wrongs we have done as you have forgiven us. Let's not hold a record of debts just as you no longer count our sins against us. Lord, we don't have the power to do this on our own. That grace must come from outside of us. So we ask you for your spirit to fill our hearts and enable us to grow in grace so we may pour that grace out to others. As it is written in Ephesians chapter 4, let us walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We pray also for our denomination and our sister churches here in Potomac Presbytery. Specifically, we lift up Emmanuel Presbyterian and its pastor, Scott Seaton. Lord, use that church to faithfully minister to the people of Arlington. We also lift up Seth George, who serves as a military chaplain. Use his ministry to promote the spiritual readiness of our military personnel and our first responders for whom he cares. Father, we pray for our local church, Heritage, and ask you for your continued grace upon us. We thank you and praise you for the reception of new members last week and also this week, Kayleen and Kezia Rapier and uh, Sam and Hannah Elton, as you continue to call your people close to you. And thank you for today's baptism of baby Juliet as you add yet another covenant child to your flock. Have your hand upon her each day of her life. We lift up Assistant Pastor Dan Warren and his family and thank you that they were able to be refreshed and connect with good friends on vacation last week. We pray that you fill Dan with wisdom and strength as he ministers to this body. We ask that you lead our congregation as it considers expanding Dan's role to be the next pastor called to this church. Give us unity as a congregation and be with the session as it completes the work of the pulpit committee. Thank you for the many servants you have raised up to minister to this local body. We thank you for our deacons who labor for our congregation and ask that you identify men who you are raising up to join them. Make their calling clear inwardly and outwardly. Thank you for the Sunday school teachers, youth group, and kids club volunteers who minister to our children. Lord, imprint the word of truth onto our children by writing it on their hearts so that no matter where they go, they will carry it with them. And we pray for our members who are unable to regularly attend worship services in person. We pray for Carol Davis, Ellie Patterson, and Bobby Trennis. We pay, pray particularly for Marvin and Barbara Breeden this week, as uh, Marvin has had some difficulty uh, during this week. Lord, carry them in your arms when they are physically weak, as they abide in your love. We pray for the caregivers who minister to those in need. We lift up Kim Nay, Scott Frazane, Mark and Diane Kilman, Bob and Julia, uh, Robin Julia Amsler, and Alan and Diane Kwiatkowski. Give them stamina to faithfully minister to their loved ones, even when things are hard. And we pray for comfort for those who have grieved the loss of loved ones, the Fadres, the Bud family, the Hutchison family, and the, Peel family, or the Pele family. Comfort them when they feel the void of loss. 
We pray for those with particular medical issues, whether acute or chronic, and pray for your healing power. We lift up Todd McVeigh as he receives new treatment for uh, his uh, sinus issues. And we pray for Peggy Locker, Bill McCall, Duncan Campbell, Bobby Trennis, Anna Maria Atchison, April Harper, and Scott Frazane's cousin, Zach. Comfort them as they endure their physical ailments. And we lift up the Champ family as they trust in your grace while facing several challenges. Lord, you know our troubles, our sins, our physical ailments, and the things that we feel powerless to change. In all these things, we lift up our voice and cry, Lord, deliver us. We do that because we believe that you hear our prayers and you are faithful to give us what we need. We praise you that you have mercy upon us and put our trust in your son Jesus in your son Jesus to reconcile all things for your glory. In his great name we pray, amen. And now I invite the ushers to come forward to collect our uh, tithes and offerings while our choir leads us in the singing of Psalm 59. Uh, please join in uh, as your singing voice is able. Our Old Testament reading is uh, Psalm 34. <clears throat> uh, Psalm 34, please hear the word of the Lord. A maskal of David. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave me the iniquity of my sin. Salah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Salah. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. This is God's holy word. Thanks be to God. This psalm says that uh, God does not merely lead us with his rod. He does not lead us by threat of punishment if we stray. I know this message is telling us that uh, he leads us by giving us his wisdom and his counsel. We need only to surrender ourselves and open our hearts to his leading and trust in his steadfast love. But we must surrender our whole selves, our mind, our body, and our soul to him. Now I invite the children uh, ages third grade and younger to come up front to hear more about how we live out this truth. All right, good morning everyone. Come on up. Hurry on over. How are you all this morning? Good? For real? Okay, I heard a couple of goods. All right, I think we're all here. Who can tell me what this is? A bridle. A bridle? Katie, would you mind helping me? I have no idea what to do with this. Can you tell me how it works? Here, I'll come over to you. So, does it go kind of like this? So this would she laughed at me. The air head. This goes over the head like this? Here, so pretend my hand is the head. So this would go over, over the head? Like, like on the neck? Nose. Like that? This is the nose band. Oh, the nose band. I'm totally backwards. So this goes on the nose like this. Then this would be coming through here like a bit. This would be like if this was my chompers, it would be right here? No, like that. Like that? And okay. These would go over their heads like reins. Like reins? And then what, what does this do? It controls the horse. It controls the horse. That's pretty cool. I am not a cowboy. I used to wear a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and Miss Mariana says my pictures in those days look pretty silly. Um, so this has to do with our sermon passage. I was going to borrow a paddle from Mr. Repass, but I didn't know he would be back today. And then James also talks about fire, but I didn't want to play with fire, because we shouldn't play with fire, right? Mr. Peel would not approve. Yeah, I love fire. You and me both. All right, so we're going to be talking about James chapter 3. We're going through James, and I want you to listen to what he says about how the tongue is like the bit and bridle that Katie just helped us learn how to use. He's talking about how not many people should want to be teachers in the church. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about what that means, but I particularly I think he's talking about people who either want to be a teacher because they think that'll make them really important, or they're very judgmental about other people, and they want to be a teacher so they can point their finger at people and say, look how wrong you are, okay? We'll, we'll talk about that. But James says, if anyone doesn't stumble in what he says, he is able, he is a perfect man, or we could say a mature man, able also to bridle, right, bridle his whole body. He says, if we put bits which is this little piece here, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies too. And he says, look at the ships also. They are so large and they're driven by strong winds. You've seen ships with sails, right? Like the old ships with the big sails. And they're driven by strong winds, but a little tiny rudder in the back, or maybe the captain is you know, using that giant uh, 
steering wheel. I'm thinking of the word in Spanish, timon, whatever it is in English. And it's controlling the rudder, and that turns the whole ship. He also says that the tongue is like a blazing fire, a blazing fire that can set on, set on fire the whole course of our life. The tongue sounds kind of powerful, doesn't it? He's not talking about, you know, just his tongue, but our speech, the things we say. Have you ever been hurt by something someone said? Does someone ever hurt your feelings when they said something that wasn't nice? Yeah, I'm not asking for examples, no, please. Um, have you ever said something, maybe to your brother, your sister, or friend that you shouldn't have said? Yeah, I see a lot of nods. I think every person in this room would nod if you looked back and looked at the adults. So where's the hope in that? James says we could be mature if we could control our tongue, but then later he says you can tame a lot of wild animals, but no one has tamed the tongue. So where's the hope in that? Well, I think the hope is in Jesus, and I want to show you in Isaiah 53 something that Isaiah says about Jesus. This is long before Jesus came. He's talking about how Jesus would come and suffer in our place, in the place of sinners. He says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. People hurt him. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Pilate, who is one of the government officials, the the governor, um, he asked Jesus, what do you say for yourself? These people are saying all of this about you. What would you say to you? What, do you, what do you say to this? How do you answer it? What did Jesus do? He opened not his mouth. He could have defended himself. He would have had every right to. He could have said some pretty powerful things if he wanted to use his speech in that way, but he had complete control over what he said because he knew it was God's will that he would suffer in our place for all the times that we have not had a bridle on our tongues and all the ways we've displeased God, so that we could be made righteous in Him. What do you think? Is that pretty good news for people like us that have a hard time controlling what we say? I think it's pretty good news. Why don't you go back to your seat, and we'll talk more about that in the sermon. Well, please open your Bibles, if you would, to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. If you're visiting with us this morning, you'll get, wor- get used to those uh, five little words. Please open your Bibles, or please turn with me in your Bibles. Anyone who stands in this pulpit uh, is called to preach God's Word and nothing except for God's Word. Um, that's relevant to our passage this morning, so I, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, in your pew Bibles, it's uh, page 1200, page 1200. So please stand if you are able for the reading of God's word in James chapter 3. This is James 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God." From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This ends the reading of God's word. Please pray with me. Father, may we humble ourselves this morning in your sight so that you might lift us up. Show us the grace of Jesus for people who are quick to speak and slow to hear. 
We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let me remind you as we begin the main point that James argues in this passage. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach... It's okay. I feel like that too sometimes. I actually just want to pause and say that is a great interruption to a service. We want to hear the voice of little ones in a service. All right? Let's back up a little bit. Let me remind you as we begin, James Point, what is he arguing in this passage? He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Uh, during my time serving in Cuba, I had the opportunity to preach in many different churches, uh, many different kinds of churches. Not always churches I might naturally choose to visit or partner with, uh, but my policy is if I'm given a pulpit, then I'll take it and preach Christ. So that's what I did. Uh, once I had the opportunity to preach at this church, and, and I say this as graciously as I can, uh, the whole service was a sham. And that's not being too harsh. That's not just me being a grumpy Presbyterian. Uh, it was emotionalism and manipulation and it was, it was just manipulative. It was horrible. Um, the worship, the singing, and then the pastor got up before they collected the offering. And he made a big speech about how they had just received a five-figure donation from a church in the U.S. And then he told the story of the widow's mites. Remember that story? The widow who goes to the temple to pray, and she puts her two little coins in the offering at the temple. Jesus and his disciples looking on. And then this pastor lowered his voice and he looked at the congregation and said, everyone turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is watching you. Right before the offering was collected. That's evil. I was not okay with that. And I had to get up and speak after this. So what do you say after something like that? I knew what I wanted to say, but I was also a guest in this church. So I looked out at these poor people who clearly... Uh, were under the thumb of wicked rulers from everything I could see. And I read Galatians 1.3, which says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I quoted from the reformer Martin Luther, who said, Grace and peace, these two little words constitute Christianity. It's what Christianity is all about. And I explained why. And this congregation of maybe 300 people just stared at me like I had three heads. They had no idea what I was talking about. It was kind of jarring to look at so many people ostensibly called into a place where they would hear the message of the gospel, but that's not what they were used to hearing. That's a horrible condemnation on a preaching ministry. And it's relevant to James's exhortation, not many of you should become teachers because of the strict judgment to come on those who twist the scripture and abuse the flock. And we're going to look today at James's warning about the desire to teach. We'll look at what that means. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's important to understand everything that he means when he says that. And then we're going to consider two more supporting points that he makes. Uh, additional warnings about, more broadly speaking, the danger of the tongue, the danger of immature, ungodly, even demonic speech. Remember, when James calls out where we go wrong uh, in his letter, he's He's evaluating uh, the life of the Christian uh, according to the wisdom from above and the wisdom from below. Wisdom from below is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. It's full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And this lack of maturity and our growing maturity in the ways of Jesus, uh, it shows up in the way we talk. It shows up in our speech. Humble faith shows up in your speech. So three warnings, uh, all warnings that we need to heed while at the same time clinging by humble faith to the hope that's ours in Jesus. Uh, first warning, a warning about the desire to teach. Secondly, a warning about the destructive tongue. And thirdly, a warning about expressing devotion to God and then despising others. So three warnings, the first of which is this, a warning about the desire to teach. Again, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So I want to explain this point, uh, really this verse, by making two points. And then I want us to consider a question about the strict judgment 
James is talking about. I'll say right now, a friend, that I think teacher in this passage refers to the office of teacher in the early church, uh, something that's fulfilled now in the elders who teach and preach in public worship. Uh, more on that when we consider the judgment James is talking about. But first, two quick points about the pitfalls of being a teacher. First, teachers say a lot of words, and every word will be judged. Proverbs 10, 19 says that when words are many, what does it say? Sin abounds. When words are many, sin abounds. That presents a problem for teachers because teachers say a lot of words. I've already said a lot of words this morning. Uh, let's, let's say the Lord gives a pastor like me the grace to fulfill this calling in good health and faithfulness for the next maybe, I don't know, 30 years. Maybe with the Lord's help, that's what I have in me. Uh, that's a lot of Sundays. That's a lot of Sunday school lessons. That's a lot of session meetings, a lot of seminars, a lot of counseling sessions. I think every pastor looks out over their calling, stretching out before them, and it's like that, you remember that old window screensaver where the stars are just kind of flying at you, going past you? I know some of you are thinking, yes, I do, but how do you remember that one? That's fair enough, but you know, the stars are whizzing past you and it's kind of mesmerizing as they get bigger and bigger and it's this never ending star field. Uh, that's kind of how I think pastors look out over their calling. If you think about all of the opportunities to mess up, uh, to say a careless word, to uh, mess up a sermon, whether by not having the time to put in the work or not making good use of your time, uh, letting your own opinions or frustrations or half-baked ideas slip in, or preaching a great sermon and then getting grumpy with your wife and kids at home. So many opportunities to fall short. So pray for pastors, would you? Uh, Matthew 12, 36 to 37. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account, this is everyone, for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. Faith vindicated by words and works. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So that's a point that's especially poignant for teachers uh, and preachers. But don't think that if you're not a teacher or a preacher, that lets you off the hook. Uh, all of us, I think, need to consider the dangers of an uncontrolled tongue, the dangers of having a platform with which to speak many, many, many words. Moms, dads, have you spoken a lot of words this week? Students, as you interact with your classmates and you pursue, pursue your studies and you talk with your teachers and you write, you, you say a lot of words, right? And you write a lot of words. Uh, phone calls, texting, Facebook, Twitter X, whatever social media uh, we're furiously sending our words out into the world with. Uh, Mark Dever, pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist, he made a great point that we live near a city that virtually traffics in words. Judge for every careless word is serious business. We need to be aware that our words, our speech, it gives evidence to the humble faith that we have in Christ. It gives evidence, it vindicates that faith that we say we have. It vindicates that faith in direct proportion to how the good works our faith produces show up in the way we talk and in the way we speak. The maturity with which we speak words and wisdom and grace. So take James's words to heart. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So that's one part of the warning about this desire to teach. Uh, the second thing, uh, teachers, teachers in the church are to speak God's words and doing anything but that is dangerous. It's dangerous. If that first point was about the quantity of words that teachers speak, uh, this point is about the quality of words that a teacher is called to speak. It goes to that stricter judgment that he points to. Teachers in the church are to speak God's words after him. And when we stray from that, it's harmful. Uh, Paul told young pastor Timothy, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So by the Holy Spirit, that's encouraging. Uh, but its command to those who teach is challenging. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is why I said at the outset uh, that turn with me in your Bibles is an important thing uh, to be part of the life of a church. Uh, it's what made that illustration about the pastor who uh, guilted his congregation before the offering so heinous, so horrible. As teachers, we're to guard the good deposit. We're to keep the pattern of sound teaching. But following the wisdom from below, following worldly wisdom, some pastors speak out of selfish ambition. 
Others clamor for a platform to speak with bitter jealousy or self-righteous judgment, hypocritically wagging their finger at others. So hear these words from Jesus in Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. That is, obey the truth that you hear them speak. Do that, but not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when they become a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Harsh words from Jesus. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So all of that applies to teachers especially, but it's not without application uh, to us. But there's a question I want us to think about now. The question's this. It'll lead into the rest of the passage. Is this stricter judgment that James talks about, is it mainly about teachers who mess up, or is it about wrong, is it about wrong motives? Could it be about the motives that a teacher has? I haven't yet explained why I understand teachers uh, to be this church role. So let me do that now. It probably refers to this role in the early church, one we read about in other New Testament passages, the same word is used. And that role is kind of rolled up, if I can say so, into the calling of a pastor teacher or an elder who teaches. Uh, most of that, would, most modern commentators, people looking at that today, would say that that's what this is about. That's what this word is referring to. When Paul writes of elders in 1 Timothy 3.2, he says they must be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. However, uh, older authors, let's say from the time of the Reformation up to the Puritans, uh, maybe John Calvin up to Thomas Manton, who's a great work on James, uh, many back then in earlier times didn't see this passage that way. They understood it to mean something like this. Not many of you should set yourselves up as judgmental people who point their fingers at others all the time. That's interesting, isn't it? That's a little bit different uh, than the concept of not many should become a teacher in the church. And I think it's really interesting, especially in light of what James seems to be calling out this church scattered among the nations about. James 1, 19 through 20, remember what it says. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James 1, 26. If anyone thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue, deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. James 2, 12 to 13. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. So here's the thing. I think that uh, these older commentators, these older writers, were working from a mistaken translation of James 3.1. I do think that we should take this to mean teachers. Uh, their Bibles that they were reading, their translation said masters. And they kind of ran in that direction. But I don't think they're completely wrong. I think the impulse is right. I think they're onto something in the context of what James is saying. Wanting to be a teacher, wanting this role, a platform by which to either pursue their own selfish ambition or through bitter jealousy and this judgmental spirit that you see condemned throughout James to lord that over other people. Something along the lines of Matthew 7, 1 to 5, when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounced, you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. James, who often speaks his older brother Jesus' words after him, he says in 4.12, there is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So, I think that's what this is about. And I think it brings it closer to home. This isn't just a sermon about preachers and teachers. Because who among us hasn't ever wanted a bullhorn 
right? A bullhorn. So you can walk up to that person and you have that person in mind, that person you think is wrong, that person that you want to tell them all about how they're wrong. Just lay on that buzzer and yell into the bullhorn and let them know just how far they fall short. I mean, who among us hasn't wanted that? I think that gets at the problem James is addressing. One recent commentary puts it this way. When James urges individuals in the Messianic community not to become teachers, he may not be concerned so much with the number of teachers or even with the candidates for teaching as he is with the impact of too many talking and teaching in irresponsible, unloving ways because of that motivation. Why shouldn't we do that? Well, because of what James says. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Those are Jesus' words. So do you really want to be measured by that standard? The standard of your own heart? The standard you hold over others that you don't even meet yourself? Not so fast, James says. Teachers will be held to strict judgment. But so will those who judge others when they haven't considered how they so often go wrong. We see that in what follows. So that's the first big point in the passage. We'll make up time now. Uh, but there's the warning about the desire to teach. Now we're going to see the warning about the destructive tongue. Maybe we shouldn't judge too quickly. And James includes himself saying, we, we all stumble in many ways. Did you catch that? That's some encouragement. If James stumbles in many ways, then maybe he's not shouting at us through his own bullhorn. If James stumbles in many ways, maybe he knows he's part of the problem. Uh, the fourth century church historian Eusebius he said James was nicknamed Old Camel Knees. I'm kind of jealous. That's way better than Dan. Old Camel Knees. Because he kneeled so much in prayer. And maybe this is why. Maybe he realized how much he needed this same grace that we all need. James has just talked about uh, earlier in chapter 2 about how our faith is vindicated by our works. And now he says, let's talk about how you talk. They thought they were going to get away with a generalization, right? We love it when we're called out generally. But James says, let's talk about how you talk. Maybe our words are the easiest way to tell if we're living by humble faith and if that's maturing in the way we live. James says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man or a mature man. He's a mature man able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, how they are so large and driven by strong winds. They're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of many great things. Just like we can put a bit uh, in a horse's mouth, right? And we can move them with the bridle and the reins. Just a little thing like the tongue can make a big difference. And it's certainly possible to refrain the tongue Proverbs 13, 3, whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. In the words of Mark Twain, he said, better to remain silent and thought a fool, you know how it finishes, than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt, right? Being quiet is a gift. It comes more naturally to some people than to others. Uh, some people do it really well. It's said of the U.S. President Calvin Coolidge that a young woman sitting next to Coolidge at a dinner party uh, confided to him or told him that she had a bet. She had a bet with her friends that she could get him to say at least three words of conversation. Without even looking at her, he, he quietly said, you lose. <laughs> it comes easier to some people, when it com but when it comes to really controlling the tongue, really refraining our tongue, not with perfection, but with maturity, out of humble faith in Jesus, uh, we could say that James is making the point here that speech uh, seasoned with maturity, with humble faith that produces uh, this maturity in us. It's this indication that we're being matured by faith, not just in speech, but in everything. You bridle the tongue, you bridle the body. It's an indication. If speech is so crucial, then mature speech is an important aspect, an indication of this maturity that humble faith produces. But even a bridled horse can spook and buck a rider. I remember my, my granddad is the cowboy in the family, and he has horses, and he had a horse that had been ill, so I guess he used like a high-protein block instead of a salt block for this horse. Uh, well, one day when the horse was doing just fine, he put the high-protein block out there again instead of the salt block. It was like he gave the horse an energy bar, 
And so he gets on the horse and it takes off with him, bucks the rider, he lands on a fence post and bruises his tailbone. That's a really bad day. But the tongue can do something like that. James goes on to show the destructive power of the tongue. Speech seasoned with the maturity of humble faith produces, uh, it shows this maturity. Uh, But immature speech wreaks havoc everywhere it goes. We know this by experience, but James paints a picture for us. Hear what he says. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. Uh, Living for as long as we did in Southern California, Uh, I know some of you have lived there too. This was vivid. It's vivid imagery for me. I remember uh, when I was in college, fires closed in on all the ridges around Placerita Canyon. We were up in the student lounge at night and one of my friends was fiddling, looking out the window. We thought it was ironic, but we were kind of scared that the the firefighters wouldn't get there in time. Thankfully, they were able to beat back the fires. Uh, They rescued our campus. But at the end of the day, there are times when the fire is going to rip through your life. You won't be able to hold it back. James describes the result as a scorched soul. He says it can set the entire course of your life on fire. Uh, One older writer I read this week said, it's hard for a ruler uh, to rule a small part of the world. How much more so to rule the tongue, which James calls a world of unrighteousness. Anyone discouraged yet? Hopefully you're getting the hang of this. When I ask if you're discouraged yet, it means that we're about to hear the good news of the gospel. Uh, Maybe you're thinking, I thought we could mature in our speech. I thought humble faith and the grace of God in Christ would overcome my destructive speech. Well, it will. It can. I think there's a glimmer of hope in what James says about taming wild animals. Look there with me. James says, for every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. I think this is clearly hyperbole. I'm not sure every kind of beast has been tamed. I don't think James had been around very many cats, for example. Uh, But theoretically, James says it's possible. You can tame an animal. You can tame a wild beast or reptile. Not so with the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. But the African church father Augustine points to the hope in this. He says it's not that no one can tame the tongue. Notice that. It doesn't say no one can tame the tongue. It's just that no human being can tame the tongue. The verse actually reads something like this. No one can tame the tongue among humans. That's like a little cliffhanger of hope. Is there not hope in the gospel accounts of Jesus? What did they say about Jesus? No one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. Jesus was human like us, but he was no mere human. He is truly God and truly man. And as man, he spoke perfectly. He never misspoke. He was the perfect man in the fullest sense, able to bridle everything about himself, tongue, heart, life, all of it. And he did it for us. Because he is God in human flesh, he spoke perfectly and maturely and humbly all the way to the cross. And he did that for you. He did it for your rescue. So hold on to that thought. As we consider one final warning, it really gets to the heart of the matter. It gets to the level at which we need the grace of God in Jesus, of whom it was said no one ever spoke like this man. So we've seen the warning about the desire to teach, the warning about the destructive tongue, now the warning about expressing devotion to God, and then going and despising others. Look with me again at the last half of verse 8 and following. The tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison, With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. For from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Many point to this part of the text, and I think they're right. Uh, saying that this is a warning in the context of worship. In the context of worship. This brings James' case to church with us this morning. We've sung 
hymns and praise today. Uh, we've prayed, we're sitting under the word, and then in just a little while, we're going to go out from this place, and in all likelihood, sinners that we are, we're going to run someone over with our speech. Varner puts it really well. He says, after solemn worship in the house of God, the professed worshiper can go forth with feelings of malice in his heart, and the language of praise can turn quickly to that of provocation. Maybe we could say this. Right now, today, in this room, we're saying blessing, honor, glory, and might be unto our God forever and ever. And then we leave here and we say bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander Monday through Friday. That's a spring that bubbles up with fresh water and salt water from the same source. How can that be, James says? That's a fig tree bearing olives, a grapevine producing figs. It's like trying to draw a cup of refreshing water from the Atlantic Ocean. How can this be? It's not natural. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 24, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's the answer? Where's the hope? Well, we've seen this before. James is driving at the two ways to live, right? He's driving at two ways to live. We're going to look at that more next week. We're to live by heavenly wisdom and not the wisdom from below. But is there any hope for people who stumble in many ways? Well, there is. Our only hope is to stand before a holy God and to humble ourselves and receive the grace that he gives. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We need something that's outside of ourselves. We come to God empty and he lifts us and fills us with his grace. I remind you of Isaiah 6, which we looked at last week in the confession of sin. This is where there's hope for people with unclean lips and immature speech. He stands before God in his holy throne room, and he sees the seraphim covering their eyes and their hands and their feet with their wings. The holy angels can't even stand exposed before this holy God. And what does he say? Isaiah 6, 5, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Even Isaiah realized he was undone before the Lord, and he needed the Lord's mercy. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. But there is hope for Isaiah's like us. There is hope for us to be saved from the fires of hell and the fires of the tongue, and that hope is in the fires of the altar. That hope is the burning coal brought from outside of Isaiah, brought to him, carried to touch his lips and to cleanse him with something he didn't have, but that he needed. The purification of sins provided from outside of you, for you, by the one of whom it was said, no one spoke like this man. No one spoke like this man. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He did it for you. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus, and that perfect sacrifice is brought to you from the altar to cleanse you of your sin. Only faith in that perfect life and that sacrificial death and that person who is for you can rescue you from the dangers and the evils of an untamed tongue. And only a faith like that can produce in you the fruit of righteousness, speech that is seasoned with grace, because you've received that grace from him. Let's pray together. Father, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to invite the Eltons to come up. Uh, Teachers say a lot of words, and I do have some things I need to say about what we're about to witness. Uh, this is a beautiful day today because we're going to receive uh, Sam and Hannah as, as members. They have been received as members by the elders, but we're welcoming them this morning publicly. And we get to baptize Juliet Rose Elton. Uh, baptism is a sacrament. It's a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, this washing with water by which Juliet... Uh, will receive God's promise to her. It's a sign and seal of Christ and all his benefits. It's applied to believers. That means as Juliet isn't 
old enough yet to know what she believes. At least we don't think so. And that doesn't mean she's not entitled to this sign. This is a picture of God's grace. It's a picture of God's mercy to those who can't even toddle up to the stage to save themselves. Uh, this is God reaching out in love and saying, You're, you are mine because your family is mine. As she receives this sign, uh, we remember that in the old covenant, God put children into the church, and nowhere has he told us to take the children out. Uh, the sign is different, but it is a sign of faith that's given both to those who believe and to their children even before they express belief. Today, Juliet will be washed with water, but we pray and we look forward to the washing of regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit and for her appeal by faith to God for a clear conscience. And we're excited for the Eltons as they begin the journey of raising Juliet in the ways of the Lord, praying that she will never know a day that she didn't say that Jesus was her Savior and that she will never depart uh, from following Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So why don't you come on up and we will first receive you both uh, publicly as members and then we will baptize Juliet. And I'm, uh, let's see, Chris, could you come up and help me? All right, well first we're going to ask you these uh, membership vows that you've already uh, been asked by the elders. Uh, this is a moment where we would like to just receive you uh, into membership. Uh, you're coming by reaffirmation of faith, which just means you're not coming from a church that we're transferring you from, so you've reaffirmed your faith to the elders. So these are the questions that I would like to ask you. Uh, you can answer with, I do. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, except in his sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Thank you. Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Uh, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? Let's go ahead and welcome Sam and Hannah. Yeah. If I could take Julia. Hi, baby. You were yawning a minute ago. Do you think this is boring? You have no idea how exciting this is. Juliet Rose Elton, member of the covenant and heir to the promises of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, you did great. Yeah, <laughs> praise Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment in the life of the Eltons and in the life of Heritage. Uh, Father, uh, 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 an optional question, but not something we consider optional that I didn't read, is that we as a congregation would promise to support uh, Sam and Hannah as they raise uh, Juliet in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I think we all say a hearty amen to taking up that responsibility and privilege. We pray that this little child would grow up knowing you and the power of your salvation. And that one day, just like the younger members we saw earlier, she would profess her faith in Jesus and the faith of her family, and the God who has promised to be a God to her and to us. And Father, we give you all the praise and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. There you go. I don't want to give you back. You can hold so her cuddly. All right. Thank you. You guys can go and have a seat. Thanks, Chris. Please take out your bulletins, and we will confess our faith together uh, using this summary of the one Lord, one faith, one baptism from Ephesians 4, 4 to 6. I'll give you a moment to find it there. Okay. So we believe 
There is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Well, it is great that we now get to celebrate the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen how he gives us visible signs and means of grace uh, that help us to understand who Jesus is for us. Today in this meal, uh, we fellowship with the risen Christ by faith in him. The Holy Spirit nourishes us with the grace and all of the benefits of Christ. Uh, Let me say a few things about how we uh, do the Lord's Supper here, and then I will pray after reading the words of institution. Uh, This is not the table of Heritage Presbyterian Church. It's the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're here this morning, you're visiting with us, we would ask that just a couple of things be true of you. First, that you would be someone who has been baptized like Juliet was, uh, that you would be someone who has received that sign of inclusion in God's covenant. Also, we would ask that you only come and partake if you have been admitted to the table uh, by the leadership of a local church under whom you live uh, under their authority and in, uh, in a local church that preaches the gospel where you're walking in accountability with them. So if you're baptized and if leadership in a gospel preaching church has admitted you to the table, you're welcome to partake this morning. Um, In a moment, what we'll do is everyone will come forward row by row and take the bread and the cup, return to your seat. There will be elders to either either side of of the table here to pray for you, or if you're here with your family, to pray for you and your family. Uh, And then we will partake of these elements together once everyone has been served. I believe that's all of the logistics. So let me go ahead and find my Bible. And I will read the words of institution from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. God says, and Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now in French and in Spanish. Car j'ai reçu du Seigneur ce que je vous ai enseigné, c'est que le Seigneur Jésus, dans la nuit où il fut livré, prit du pain et après avoir rendu grâce, le rompit et dit, ceci est mon corps qui est rompu pour vous. Faites ceci en mémoire de moi. De même, après avoir soupé, il prit la coupe et dit, « Cette coupe est la nouvelle alliance. En mon sang, faites ceci en mémoire de moi toutes les fois que vous en boirez. Car toutes les fois que vous mangez ce pain et que vous buvez cette coupe, vous annoncez la mort du Seigneur, du Seigneur jusqu'à ce qu'il vienne. » Y en español, para los hispanohablantes, porque yo recibí del Señor lo mismo que les he enseñado. Que el Señor Jesús, la noche en que fue entregado, tomó pan. Y después de dar gracias, lo partió y dijo, esto es mi cuerpo que es para ustedes. Hagan esto en memoria de mí. De la misma manera, tomó también la copa después de haber cenado diciendo, esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hagan esto cuantas veces la beban en memoria de mí. Porque todas las veces que coman este pan y beban esta copa, la muerte del Señor proclaman hasta que Él venga. Please pray with me. Father, as we are served now from this table, uh, minister to us by the work of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen us by grace and the faith in which we stand and the hope of the glory of God. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please come.
all of you. The blood of the new covenant, the covenant of grace shed for you. Take drink of it, all of you. Amen. Please stand if you are able. Our song of response will be, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in your bulletin. Please hear now God's word of blessing on you as you leave this place. We'll hear this in English and then Spanish and then French. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. 
y que nuestro Señor Jesucristo mismo y Dios nuestro Padre que nos amó y nos dio consuelo eterno y buena esperanza por gracia, consuele sus corazones y los afirme en toda obra y palabra buena. Que nuestro Señor Jesús lui-même y Dios nuestro Père que nos ha aimé y que nos ha dado por su gracia una consolación eterna y una buena esperanza, console vos cœurs y vos afermis en toda buena obra y en toda buena palabra en nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Santo Espíritu. Amén. <coughs> 